um, recording. So I've just started the recording now. Um, and just a very big welcome to everybody. So lovely to have such a great turnout. Uh, we had 50 registrations for today's event. Um, people dropping in and out as per their schedules allow. That's why we record. Um, and I think the topic got everybody's interest. This actually came up for those of you who were in our year end event uh, at the end of November last year. We asked people to um, kind of just share what their highlight of the year was and and how things turned. And quite a few people commented on the, the changes they had gone through. So I thought it was really a topical conversation and identified three willing speakers and um, just from completely different perspectives and experience. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing them today. Um, just a little introduction. Most of you on this call should know who I am, but there are a few names that I don't yet recognize. And um, so thank you for sharing the invite far and wide. Um, I'm Lauren. Uh, in 2015, um, I was at my first Microsoft partner event in um, Toronto. And I came across uh, the Women in Tech Network. And um, I was with Yvonne at the time. And we went to the women's lunch. And we learned about this amazing network and what their purpose is. And there wasn't representation in South Africa. So we brought it back to South Africa and we've been going strong ever since. Um, and you can see all the links over there. If you haven't yet joined us on LinkedIn, there's the that you can search for us. It's the WIT Network South Africa. But the entire network is focused on getting more women into um, uh, technology and STEM careers. Um, making it more accessible and then leadership um, development and support and then supporting each other, entrepreneurs and new businesses and that type of thing. So it's an entire global network and the representation is really, really awesome. Um, and so that's what we're, we're about. And here in South Africa, we've been meeting virtually uh, for two years now and um, we uh, um, hope to meet in person soon. It would be wonderful to see you all in 3D. Um, but yeah, we've kind of made it work quite nicely. And I think um, having a session like this and recording it, you know, we've got a, a YouTube channel that Karika put together for us. Um, and we can you can go back to the content and share it far and wide. Um, and I think the topics have been really um, interesting and a broad range of speakers. So that's really, really cool. In South Africa, obviously, we've we've got, um, you know, we're in a different place to global, um, to um, countries like the US or Canada or Europe in terms of um, education and that type of thing. So there are a lot of wonderful initiatives about getting young girls exposed to technology and to opportunity. One of our speakers is going to be discussing that. Um, and also just within your organization, getting um, more voice from women and, and um, utilizing technology in different fields and that. So really interesting. And then the third focus in for us here in South Africa is around leadership development. So just getting more representation in leadership. I think right now in South Africa, the stats I shared with you last year, I think um, at a C-suite level, women don't yet, I don't think we've um, reached the 20% um, mark yet. And in IT companies, that's significantly lower. Um, and so that's definitely something that it's, you know, we raise the awareness and work towards. So that's what, and that's all from me. I'm going to jump straight into our speakers. All three of them are on. I haven't given them an order, so um, in no particular order, I'm going to start with uh, how I have it in the in the photos. So our three speakers today, we've got Karina. Um, Karina is actually, I think you also one of our longest members, Karina. I'm sure you started like way back in the early days. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Karina and then Zandile, which some of you 
have worked with Sandile um, created a wonderful NGO and that has turned into one of the most dynamic organizations around getting girls exposed to technology. And then lastly is Nicole, who has been a WIT participant um, as a student and uh, she's made a very big and bold um, ca uh, career direction change um, that involved like big, big decisions. And so I thought it would be a great opportunity to hear her. So ladies, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's very interactive. So we're going to listen to each of them and you're welcome to ask questions and give comments. Please use the chat and let's get right into it with Karina. Thanks, Law, And thank you for the introduction and hi, everybody. Um, so when when I initially said to Lauren, I'll talk about the changes in my life, I was actually going a little bit further back than just last year, just because the last three changes had such a big impact in my career. So I wanted to give a little bit of history. Um, and for me, the big thing is, is these last three years and these last three changes has really drove home for me that no matter how scary a change is, if you embrace it, it always works out for the better. Um, so for me, it's been been a very good three years, even though it's been very hard. So a little bit of history. Um, I've been in IT for 20 years, um, mostly in the ERP space. I started working for Merck as an IT business partner for Southeast Africa in 2016. Um, and that was my first role that was not purely ERP. So it was was a little bit wider, which was fantastic. And I, and I loved that role. And I was part of the local country council. Um, the company I'm working in um, is a multinational it's called Merck. And there are 58,000 people worldwide in 60 countries. Um, and as you can understand, the South African market, even though big in South Africa, is actually quite small in comparison to the rest of the world. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic to work in because um, in South Africa, you, you, you're like a, a main man, but in the rest of the world, you're actually like very, very small. So it's, it's very, very nice to work in those different environments. Um, so to get back in 2018, we had a new group CIO starting with Merck and having a look at the IT structure at the time, he decided to restructure. And with South Africa's market not being deemed big enough, my role was made redundant in South Africa. Um, and this was my big first change because first of all, it's not a change that I asked for. It's not a change that I was looking for. And um, it, it was quite a scary process to not have a job and then go through months of back and forth until you find something or is given something. Um, so in this process, I was offered the role of a project manager in the Europe region um, for our life science business. And um, this, this was a big change because it was a different a role to my previous role. Being a business partner, you're more strategic, you're more planning, you're more you know, working with the business daily to get their strategy rolled out. Whereas a pro project manager is very operational. You know, you're at the other end of the spectrum and implementing what other people have planned so far. Um, not only was it a big change for that reason, but also I had no network in Europe. I've not worked with anybody in Europe. And um, it's new people, new systems, new network. So it was very, very difficult. Um, and then with Merck, they didn't like at the time to have people working in regions that they weren't living in. So the conversation started to move us, my family, to Germany. Um, and this was, was a very sc scary thought because that's not what we wanted. My daughter had just started school and absolutely loved it. My husband was building a new business. So it was terrible timing for us to even think about leaving South Africa. Um, but I decided, decided to take the role anyway, um, you know, because why not? Um, I did have a look around at large organizations within South Africa, but honestly, I couldn't find another working environment like I had within Merck. I mean, Merck is a fantastic company to work for. They develop their people, they look after their people, you know, um, they, they love taking us out of our comfort zones and they, they drive us to grow into new roles. But, you know, there's a lot of good in the company. So I stayed and I took the role and ran with it. Um, so to get back to the conversation to move to Germany, um, I then 
proposed to them that we do a trial. So it was a trial role for me to see if I could work remotely, but also for the company to view it as an experiment to ascertain if it was possible for people to work in different countries to where they're actually physically located. Now, this is before COVID, so this was very new to everybody. Um, and luckily for me, I worked hard and, and it, it all worked out. And then COVID hit or, you know, not COVID, but COVID hit and everything died down. There was no changes. There was no moves. There was no moving to different countries. The whole world was just dealing with the pandemic. So that big change that was coming with that role all of a sudden, that scare went away. But I love the role and I kept doing it and it was great. So then my second big change came in 2021, which started in 2020. Um, and this was as a PM, I was given a role to implement all the Brexit changes onto the ERP systems across the life science sector. Now, this is this spans multiple countries, multiple systems, multiple functions. Um, so it was a really rough three years for me. It was long hours. It was no leave, an enormous amount of stress. My poor family um, didn't know what to do with me. But we got through it. The project was implemented successfully. And as a result of that, I was nominated for the International Management Program, which is a prestigious program within Merck. As I've mentioned, Merck love developing the people that identify their high performers. And this is one of those programs where you do a year long program in management. Um, and as a result of the international management program, I then also got promoted to a global business partner responsible for Europe, North America and Latin. Um, so this is my second big change. And this was last year. So this is the one I was mentioning when we talked in our previous um, session. Um, again, this was a big change because now we're going back from operational to strategic and planning and management is a much larger region which is across varying time zones, different cultures, languages, um, especially LATAM, which is it's very, the people in um, South America do not speak a lot of English. So it's, it's very challenging to do business with them as an English speaker. Um, I had to start building relationships two levels up in the business. So that was a huge personal and career development opportunity. And then time-wise, I'd already committed to the international management program. So now I've got this 30% overhead of the program on top of a new role. So, you know, talk about challenges, why not? Um, and I mean, it was great. 2021 was amazing. It was a busy year, but it settled down and I love my new job and I've gotten through my IMP and, and it was a fantastic year. But then at the end of 2021, they threw my last change at me that I wanted to tell you guys about. And that was, I was given a role promotion to director level. So now what that means within the Merck world is that we now more responsible to Merck. We're more responsible for growing Merck. You know, the women in leadership topic must be driven and is very important. Um, we're part of people development. We're part of sustainability. We're part of driving a high impact culture, diversity and inclusion. Um, so there's a lot of additional people topics that comes along with that director level. And that was my last change in the last three years that I've gone through. Um, and then, of course, as expected, the topic to move back to headquarters in Germany has now become more persistent. We're in the throes of those discussions. Um, however, having gone through the first two changes, I'm also now better equipped to ask the right questions to ensure my family's needs are met, to drive the conversation on my career, my development, you know, what is the next steps? Just moving to Germany is, is, not, a, is not a thing. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for my family? Um, and I, I think the point I wanted to make just by telling you my little story is, is that whatever the next change is, this process, this three changes over the last three years has been very scary for many different reasons. But I embraced it and the reward has been far greater than any of the fear I had on any of these changes. And I think for me, that's the most important, important part of change is go for it. It can never be as bad as you think it's going to be. And that's my story in a nutshell. Amazing. <laughs> you really um, under underplayed, uh, Karina, the things that you've discussed on, are actually monumental. Um, 
So I've made some comments. I, I can see lots of clapping and that. Um, I'm sure there'll be a couple of questions. But one of the things um, that you mentioned was around sitting down with the powers that be and proposing a new way of work or proposing. So when the conversations about Germany first came up, you proposed that a, there was a trial period first and we see how that goes. You know, that requires a level of confidence and um, and safe, you know, a, a safe environment that you feel that you can do that. So how did you create that um, and, and create that for the people around you? Um, I don't know if I, I don't know. Maybe it's it's sometimes just being dumb. I I I rush into things head first. So I don't know if I created a safe space or whether I just went for it and it worked out well. Um, but I'm certainly a take the bulls by the horn sort of person. So I wasn't going to be pushed into a corner to take a position and then be forced to move my family without knowing what that means, what that means for my career and what the next thing is. So I, I started the conversations and I asked the questions. And if you really get not, so when you work in a multinational, there's a lot of people that want to, they want to move to Europe, they want to move to the US, they want to get out of various places, Africa, India, you know, wherever we are and move into these first world countries. For me as a South African, that has never been a driving force for me. I love South Africa and I love living here. And, and you do have issues. I mean, we got broken into in December when we were on holiday. My car got stolen, got packed full of stuff and they left, you know, and you'd think you would go, yeah, I just want to move to Germany. I've had enough. But we live a charmed life. You know, we live a really good life. And that's what I was fighting for. I had been to Germany. I know what they live like. I know how small the houses is. I know how cold it is. I know how the kids don't have an outside life like our kids have. And that's what I was fighting for more than pushing against the job requirements. And I think that's what you need to know is even though a career is important, the rest of your support system is as important. And that's your family and what you do to them and why you're doing it to them. Um, and, and I think that brings to me to the same discussion I'm having today is I'm saying, I understand why they want me in Germany, you know, women in leadership, it's a big topic. I'm now on a level where it's visible to nice to have visibility of an IT person in headquarters, etc. But that's what they're going to get. What am I going to get? What are my family going to get? How are we going to live? And until those answers, questions are answered. I'm not just packing my bags and moving somewhere else, anywhere else, you know, um, because I don't want to leave South Africa. I'm not running away. Yes. I'm moving towards something. And that's the difference. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Are there any questions? I see there have been a few comments. Um, anybody have a question? Um, nice comments there, uh, Karina. I don't know if you've read them, but yeah, I think... Um, Michelle's just put there, as a woman, we tend not to ask, what am I going to get? And I think that's a very valid point here. Yeah. Very, very cool. And and the focus on the work-home balance. I think that's, yeah, I think sometimes women feel uh, if you get, uh, you know, this career opportunity, you've got to take it at all costs because you don't know when it'll happen again. And so they make snap decisions or, or one focused decisions because of that and it has a far reaching impact. Mm. And, and I think that's that's a very valid point. I mean, know your worth. You know, if if I they wanted me to go to Europe for a reason, you know, they gave me that job for a reason. So don't just throw your hat in the ring and go, that's fantastic, let me do it. I also add value and understand that value, you know. And asking questions, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. If they come back with valid answers, then by all means, you know, somebody said to me the other day, be careful what you ask for because they might give it to you and then you're going to have to go to Germany. And I said, well, let's see what they give me. But until they give me what I want, that is not, you, you don't make a change for the sake of change. Yes. Know where you're going as well, you know. I really yeah. love what you've just said there is knowing your own value. I think that is beyond critical to any of these um, discussions is that when you know your own value and you can 
stand up for yourself or or even just present yourself and and present your thoughts and your and your um arguments you 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 know that it has value very yeah. cool Karina, thank you so much. Really, really fantastic. And uh, yeah, keep us posted. I will. Thank you so much. Awesome. Fantastic. Next up, there we have Zandile. Hello, Zandi. How's it going? Hi, Lauren. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's been a while. I feel like we haven't actually talked in person since probably... Uh, when we came, when I came to see your new offices, when did you oh, move yes, to your new yes, office? Yes. Last year, no, that was that was great. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you, um, I, I, we speak about Girl Code often, but Girl Code um is uh, quite a few people, quite a few um companies on in the South Africa Wood chap, uh, chapter have partnered with Girl Code. Is a wonderful way to really you know, put your money where your mouth is with regards to getting girls exposed to technology and giving them the runway that they need to get to get their foot in the door and make it work from there. Um, Zandile published an incredible report uh, in January, early this month, just around their achievements. So you can imagine pivoting an entire organization that is directed at um, girls who come from disadvantaged circumstances onto a virtual platform and doing a tremendous job. So change, change, is, uh, change is your middle name and uh, you've done a great job, Sandy. So why don't you take us through it? Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, when you asked me to talk about like some of the biggest changes that have happened, I just thought about you know what where's the right point to start and i think 2019 is a is a good starting point because for me that's when i made my first biggest change and that's when i decided to quit my job my very nice job <laughs> which i liked to pursue girl code full time um so quickly by way of introduction for those that don't know my name is Zandile, um, as lauren has said and i am one of the three co-founders of Girl Code, which is a social enterprise aimed at empowering young girls and women through technology. So prior to 2019, you know, a lot of our focus was on just going into the schools, um, having weekend, you know, workshops, just teaching the basic stuff of, of coding, having hackathons and events. Um, and I think 2019, that's when I made the decision let me quit my, my nice job and do this full time, you know, because I believed that there's so much more we could do for young girls across the country. Um, and it just needed it needed my full attention because just being at the office and thinking about Girl Code throughout the day <laughs> wasn't working, um, you know, so I thought, OK, this is it. This is something that, you know, at the time also felt was the right was the right time to take a risk. I was, I was young enough, um, didn't really have too much commitments, and I thought this is it for me. So um, quit my job, and then you know myself and one of my co-founders decided we're going to run Code full time, and we're going to do you know programs, still kind of um, more initiatives than an actual educational programs, but you know more focused in doing them more regularly. And, you know, that was going well. I think we were all excited. We were talking to our partners. I mean, Mint Technologies has been with us for quite a number of years. And then 2020 happened. <laughs> and we were like, OK, maybe I shouldn't have quit my job. Um, and I think, you know, that transition where a lot of companies, you know, didn't know what was happening. They had to react quickly. Funding had to be diverted from what was initially planned to now obviously aiding people, um, you know, giving like food parcels and stuff like that. And we found ourselves in a position where we were like, OK, you know, we started thinking we have a lot of a lot going, a lot of partners that had committed to be with us. Um, but of course, like nobody could have predicted it. So what do we do as an organization? Um, and we just thought we, we spent a lot of 2020 thinking about like everybody else virtual, you know, can like e-learning work in the context of South Africa? 
And for us, a lot of our beneficiaries, you know, this, this, there's two major challenges that we have to overcome. The first one being having laptops. I think, you know, a lot of us, it's, it's easy to take for granted that there's a laptop. I mean, in my home alone, there's like three laptops. Um, and I think in a lot of homes, there's two or, or three laptops and a lot of our beneficiaries, unfortunately, don't have that. Even their parents, they don't, most of them don't work in corporate, so they don't even have a, a work laptop that they could access. So that was the biggest challenge. And, you know, we had to think about, OK, how do we how do we navigate this? And one of the things we had done um, in 2020 is then starting to go to corporates and and sort of asking for second hand um, donations that we could then in turn donate to our beneficiaries, because, you know, a lot of corporates every second year they, you know, well, it depends on the corporate, but generally they have a rotation where uh, old laptops go out and then it, new ones come in. And we thought that's a good way to partner with organizations that, that have that in place, where we could then in turn give these young girls something that they could utilize, you know, to be part of our programs. So that was challenge number one. Um, and obviously, like, trying to achieve that at, at scale is still a major stumbling block, but we've seen, you know, tremendous results where a lot of corporates have come on board, even individuals that have said, like I just said now, you know, I have, I have two laptops at home, the one I haven't opened it, you know, for a whole year, how about I donate it? And that has really helped in terms of the uptake for our e-learning. And the second one is data. I think we all are aware, uh, data is expensive. I mean, I, I didn't have internet, um, my Wi-Fi went down, so I downloaded, um, well, I bought data for a webinar, it was an hour webinar, and like five gig, all of it was gone. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, I can't, I can't afford to be online um, because if I keep buying data, you know, how much do I have to spend? And so um, that's like our biggest challenge right now in terms of trying to scale our programs, right? Because we know online is here to stay. We can't go backwards. Um, we have to we have to adapt and we have to make it work for the context that we are living in. So one of the things that personally I've taken up as a challenge is just to kind of rally the telecommunications, um, you know, the, the, the four major ones and and get them to, you know, zero rate our online learning. I think for me, you know, achieving that would would kind of be a really big step in terms of our goal. So we have this audacious goal of 10 million women in the next 10 years and having online learning be accessible and be free in terms of data would truly be a game changer, I believe. And so, um, you know, Celsius is actually one of the companies that have said, yes, we are keen um, to support you just finalizing that and in the next couple of months, you know, we'll probably like launch it. So um, I believe that's like a good step in terms of, you know, overcoming what what we now the reality we're all facing in terms of COVID and working from home and all these things. Because not everybody, you know, has the luxury of having Wi-Fi. So that's that has, you know, some of the things we had to deal with. And then I think one of the bigger changes that happened in, in 2021, so 2020 was a lot of ups and downs, you know, trying to figure out where are we as an organization, what do we do, and how do we position ourselves for 2021? Because, you know, I think we all were figuring it out and we wanted to make sure that when 2021 starts, we are in the best position to go to corporates and, and show them the value that we can provide for them, but also for our beneficiaries. And so, we knew that you know online is definitely like a no-brainer. Um, one of the things we did was think about the educational context in South Africa, and you know BE uh, for all its faults, I think it plays a critical role also in sort of keeping corporates um, somewhat accountable um, and making it easier also for organizations such as ours to position ourselves in a way that also benefits a corporate, right? And so we. we we the one of the, the first biggest change was getting our accreditation with MICT CETA to run our ownership of which Mint is a sponsor of. And that that's that's a critical thing when you're thinking about skills development. A lot of corporates definitely find um, you know mainly accredited skills development, and we thought this is a good space to to put ourselves in. 
Um, and from that funding, you know, we actually it allowed us to get our first office space, which for me, uh, even today when I walk into it, I'm just amazed because I think when I started in 2014, it's just a, a hackathon. That was it. There was no grand plan. Um, and then now we have like 30 young girls coming into our offices um, and me just going to my office <laughs> every day. I literally, I think yesterday or this Monday, um, tweeted how, how amazing it is that I, I wake up and actually get to go to my own office. So honestly, that was one of the biggest changes and the most really humbling and amazing experience that I've, I've ever had. Um, knowing that we are now getting to a place where we can start making real, real impact. Right? Over the years, we definitely have been, um, you know, and we've seen where our goals have landed up. But this was, this was a change that I was saying, OK, <laughs> it's time to step up now. Um, and with getting an upper space, then came um, having to hire people. So getting empl more employees. We went from, it was just the two of us with a project manager, to now having eight people in a space of a year. So that's pretty exciting, you know, because I'm like, wow, okay, we're now employing eight people. But I think that was also one of the most challenging thing. And and I suppose as a young entrepreneur, you don't anticipate, right? Um, I, I kind of walk every day like, oh, all things will be good. It's all great. But uh, the one thing I've learned is to value HR. I think, you know, people take it for granted, but um, managing people or having people in different dynamics is, has been tough. And we, you know, we've gone through, as much as it's only been literally a year, um, we've gone through a lot of sort of, um, you know, people, people dynamics and issues that, that I, would, I would have never encountered, um, you know, before. And so, for me, that was that was one of those biggest changes. Having to to kind of manage people's expectations, um, think about what kind of people do I want to be part of the organization, um, what kind of culture are we building, you know, beyond myself when I leave the organization, and then I was like, okay, <laughs> HR is a serious role that you need from day one. If there's any entrepreneur in here or anyone thinking about it, um, make sure you have HR from day one and make sure you have lawyers as well from day one <laughs> uh, to make sure your contracts and all of that is good. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, a sort of second big change um, for, for, for the year, having people and also within the same year, you know, having to let go of people. As I said, when, when it comes to people dynamics, there's a lot that until you, you, you're in it, you don't really think about. And for me as an entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's also made me, I think, all the better for it um, in terms of how to deal with different people um, and understanding that not everybody is going to be excited every day. And you know, for me, for example, I, I don't have working hours, you know, but that that's, of course, that's it's my baby. So I'm working at midnight, I'm working at a, um, in the AMs if I'm awake and I'm thinking of something, but when when you also building a team you know you have to think about people's me mental health you have to think about their families and you know it might seem exciting to me to be up at 1 a.m thinking of a new idea but you know <laughs> to an employee it's like yes i believe in the mission and i love it um but i also want to sleep <laughs> so that's just some of like the big changes and dynamics i've had to you know, kind of work through this year with the team. And the biggest thing for us was kind of making the decision that we are now moving into a space where we're becoming an educational institution. Um, it's no longer we're just having events here, um, we're doing workshops here. We, we are becoming an educational institution and we want to impact lives across Africa, not just South Africa. And so we want to start building campuses everywhere where young girls can come in and get a good quality education that allows them to get sustainable jobs. I think that's the critical thing. And what's amazing about technology is you don't necessarily have to learn for three to four years, right? In a space of three months, you can be equipped to actually start a job and learn on the job because it changes so much. 
you, once you have the basics and the foundation right, you just, whatever technology is being used, you come in and you learn it. And we've seen this globally where more and more companies are embracing that type of thing where you can learn online, you can get, um, you know, certifications, you can go through boot camps and, and companies will hire you. You know, so for us, that is the the biggest thing, the biggest change that we've had to navigate and thinking about what does it mean to become an educational institution and how do we then, you know, from just this one, you know, space we're in, how do we replicate that across South Africa? And then how do we replicate that across the whole African continent? Um, and I believe that with online, for e-learning, that's, you know, scaling is no longer something that can take 10 years. Scaling can happen rapidly and we've just, we've seen it also with, with us. Um, just last year, we've got 300 um, students that are completing the boot camp within the last couple of months. Overall, last year, we had over 700 students, which is the largest number we've ever had. And that's because that's the reach of, of online. Um, then that's just the tip of the iceberg for us because once we, especially once we get the, the zero rating right, you know, I'm just excited to move from 300 to 3,000 to 30,000, 300,000 until we get to that 10 million. Um, and yeah, like time is, is, is racing, but I, I think we're up for the task and I'm just really blessed more than anything. Besides the challenges we faced, I think some of the, the changes that we've come across last year have been amazing and they've impacted my life personally um, in, in such tremendous ways. And when I see where the girls land up and the opportunities that they're getting, it just makes it worthwhile. It makes it feel like, OK, this is my purpose. This is the reason that I was specifically brought into this world. And I'm just grateful that I get to live it every day, that I get to wake up and and really change people's lives in a meaningful way. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm honestly, you know, blessed to be in the space. And I love the team that I, I work with, which is quite important, you know, because they contribute to the work that we do. And I wouldn't change it for the world. So that's my my quick story about Gold Code and kind of, you know, the space we've had to navigate and how we're thinking about changing education, um, especially when it comes to technology and using it not only to enable, um, but as a tool that, you know, our beneficiaries can then take and go out there and change their worlds um, and change the world in general in their own spaces. So, yeah, that's that's sort of what me. Thank you. Zandile, that was very, very inspirational. I think one thing you didn't mention was that round about the time you started Girl Code, you also had your own little baby, an actual baby. <laughs> yes. So you had this baby and a real baby, and 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 you you've pulled it all together. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean having a son. I mean our, our sons are like pretty close in age. Is yeah, he's very very active, um, and I think part of it uh, when because uh, a lot of people actually ask me what about boys, you know. So I get this question a lot, and I always say that. It's not that I want to create a world where women rule and it's a matriarchy. Although I genuinely believe that would be a great world. That would be, you know, a happy, peaceful world. But um, we are working towards equality, right? And I'm, I'm also showing my son that you don't have to be threatened by women. Um, they can have opportunities and you can also have opportunities. But unfortunately, the reality is young women are not getting as many opportunities. The stats are there. Um, the World Economic Forum, the latest report says 26%, you know, in most global companies. So we are working for that 50%. And that's why for now we need to focus on women. Um, but our Gold Coder Club, you know, which is for primary and high school, that actually has boys in it because it, it's in line with what we are saying, that we're working to a world where it's 50-50. But at the same time, we need to address the issue that we have now, which is a huge gender gap in technology. Um, but yeah, like <laughs> having a son just also puts it in perspective that I want to create a world for him where he also has opportunities and girls have opportunities and they're not fighting, you know, each other. Yeah. It's because there's space for everybody. Yeah. And I think um, perhaps 
I'm sure you're aware of it, but I know that you are incredibly humble and you wouldn't acknowledge it. But you know, we often um, in we've often spoke about having goal models where people can identify with somebody like yourself from a gender or racial or demographic or motherhood, whatever it is, and they can go, well, if she can do it and this is where she's got, then I can do this. This is a pathway because not everybody's parents are in um, occupations that are sustainable or, or, you know, that that kids want to do at a later stage. And so I think it also becomes almost part of um, giving up your career is that you've actually just embraced your vocation, your calling. Um, and, you know, to make change happen, you know, um, we can talk about change all day long, um, but it, it requires action, you know, and I think you just looking at all the comments, um, you know, you're making it happen. And I think that's really powerful. And absolutely, the fact, uh, I think it's terrible that we pay for data, one. Worse than that is I think that um, the fact that data expires is, uh, it's actually, I think it's it's a human rights travesty. It's putting people in untenable situations and data does not expire. That is for their balance books and they are making a significant amount of profit off a 30 day um, expiration date on data, which is um, an unquantifiable entity that has no expiration date. And so I think um, it's it's a travesty that organizations have um, expiration date on data, but that your conversation around accessibility and the South African context is relevant. I see, you know, people asking here to reach out to you, how do you work together? So I have shared your website, but really, are there any questions or comments for Zandile? Everybody's got stage fright. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you know how to read Sandile. I have put her website up there. Otherwise, you can also find her on LinkedIn. Um, there's various ways, or you can even just reach out to me for an email address. But wonderful initiative to be a part of. Thank you, Zandi. Really appreciate you today. Thank you so much, Lauren. I appreciate this forum. And like you said, I've networked with a lot of people here that have supported us. And I hope to meet even more people um, in the future. And, and someday I can be also that person that supports somebody else that comes up here um, and is doing amazing work. So thank you. Thanks, ladies. Um, I'm still Fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. And then last but not least is Nicole. Hello, Nick. How's it going? Good, good, thanks, and you? Good, thank you. Um, so as I described earlier, for those of you that were on the call from the beginning, um, Nicole is part of the Mint family. Her parents um, are my colleagues. And um, in, her, in her first life, she was quite a dedicated and committed CA student, so all the accountants on the on the call can jump for joy. Um, and then something happens. So Nicole, we're excited to hear about your big change. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to, like to welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here today to be able to share my story with you. Um, so I'm going to start my story from when I finished school. My first change came when I left school in 2017. I moved to Stellenbosch to start my tertiary education. I started with a mathematical science degree because I finished school absolutely loving maths. And as we all know, in school, grade 11 matric, you're trying to decide what you want to do after school and where to go. And it's not that easy to decide. So with my love for maths, I thought this would be probably the best route to go for. Um, within my first week of my degree, I decided that it was all maths, maths, and more maths, and not as broad as I was looking for. So I went and I searched what the BCom faculty had to offer, and that's when I moved to a Bachelor of Accounting. Uh, during my first year, I realized that the option of UCT's Business Science Finance with Accounting would be much more suited to what I was looking for, and so began the application to UCT, which I did um, I moved in my second year, 2018. At the beginning of my fourth year, I decided to get a bit of work experience to see what life would be like after university. 
So I went to an accounting firm, also a legal firm, just to get a broader background. It's safe to say that I wasn't feeling inspired or overjoyed at what I'd been doing for the past two weeks, um, working in these practices, and I realized that this definitely would not be my forever profession. From a young age, I've always loved animals, being around them, caring for them, anything animal related is where you would find me. Um, during my vacation work, well, after the accounting and the legal firms, I had to finish off my holiday work, so I decided to go to a veterinary practice just to have some fun and enjoy the last bit of my holiday. And I absolutely loved it there. I was there from seven to seven every single day to finish off my holidays. What initially put me off my fear of going into veterinary science when I finished school was the thought of operating on animals and euthanizing animals. However, I think I matured a lot during my first two, three years of varsity. And when I went to work at the vet practices, I became a lot more comfortable with the idea of this and realized this is actually what I was passionate about. The euthanizing is maybe 1% of the job and I didn't want to give that up just for that small part of it. So when I realized that it was manageable, I decided that this is actually what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go with my life. Um, when I speak to a lot of people and tell them about my change, they're completely shocked and have absolutely no idea how I could go from accounting to a medical degree. Um, and after speaking to a few people, I started second guessing myself and thinking, are you sure? Is this the right choice? Are you, are you making the right change? Um, but after working with the vets and putting a lot of thoughts into it, I realized that my first degree is not a waste. It can only be beneficial in the future. Um, by having both degrees, my future goal is to open up my own veterinary practice. And so with my veterinary degree, I'll have the medical side of it. Um, with my finance degree, I'll have the business side of it. So it can only help in the future. Um, that being the first change in terms of careers, I also had to move countries in order to pursue my studies in veterinary science. So in August last year, I moved from South Africa to Budapest. Um, the adjustment was quite a lot to get used to. I moved away from all of my support structure, my family. I knew maybe two people when I went there and yeah, it was quite, quite a lot to take in. Um, I managed to make a great group of friends, which definitely helped with the settling in Europe. Um, some of the major changes that I've had to adapt to, which I'll share with you, is firstly learning Hungarian as a language. It's not as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, we are taught in English, but I thought it would help just to get around in terms of shopping and navigating the city. Um, secondly was the purchasing of food. It's been quite interesting as I'm not used to all the labels that we get in South Africa, so I had to use Google Translate a lot. And one of the examples was I decided to make a milk tart for Christmas. Um, turns out I had the completely wrong flour and my milk tart tasted quite a lot like corn. That was quite an interesting one. Um, navigating Budapest in the public transport, Google Maps soon became my best friend in order to get around there. And lastly, most importantly, is the weather change. I miss the South African summer, the sun being outdoors, short tops and all of that. I mean, when I came back, I actually became so pale. My brother asked me if I was sick when I got home. So that was that was quite a quite an interesting one. But overall, it really hasn't been that challenging. Um, it's rather an exciting and liberating adventure and journey that I've been on. And I've managed to settle quite nicely in the new city. And needless to say, I'm very excited and motivated to get back and start with my second semester in Budapest at the beginning of February. There's um, just a PowerPoint that I want to share to show a few pictures of while I've been over. Um, I need to share my can you see the screen? There you go. So this is the parliament building in Budapest um, from the water, from the Danube. It has a few pictures that I took um, on the far right hand side, one where my mom came to visit over Christmas. Um, there we have the Danube, the view of the city um, and St. Stephen's Basilica. And this was my first day of veterinary school with our plenary of the horse and our first dissection. Thank you. Amazing, Nicole. Thank you so much. So I was trying to find, because you accepted the invite from your university account and all the bottom part was in Hungarian, and I wanted to snip it and share because I don't think people understand um, how complex Hungarian is. I think it's one of the most difficult languages to learn. Very, very complex. And it's not even, you know, Spanish and French, we can read and kind of get the gist of something. This was just like, oh my word. So, I mean, 
doing a medical degree uh, in, a, in a country where the language is completely, completely foreign is truly, truly a big step. Yeah. How's your Hungarian coming along? I can say a few words. I know my vocab quite well. I can get around the shops now, but it's definitely nowhere near where it needs to be. And um, is the requirement for your course that you have to speak Hungarian? No, so we actually have within the university, there's three streams. So there's an English stream of about 150 mm -hmm. students, a Hungarian stream of 180 students, and a German stream of 150 students. So I'm within the English stream, which is mostly the international students, everyone who doesn't speak Hungarian or German. So that definitely helps being taught in English, but you obviously get the Hungarian accents every now and then, which makes it quite difficult to, to understand. Okay, awesome. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, I mean, the most common places for South Africans to go and study, it would be the UK, the USA or Australia. Um, what was one of the driving forces around Hungary? So initially I applied at Honest Deport, but there weren't enough places. And there's actually, I've come to realize quite a lot of South Africans in Budapest. And I think one of the main reasons that we're there is firstly, it's one of the oldest European veterinary schools um, and the most international one. And also the Stipendium Hungaricum Scholarship, which is a mix between the South African government and the Hungarian government, which fund your studies over there. So that definitely helps given the international student fees, which are quite, quite large. So yeah, I think that's the main thing. And how long is the degree? It's five and a half years. Okay. And then when you do your practical, will you do the practical in Hungary or can you do it anywhere? So we don't have a practical part of the degree. We do that within the degree. Oh, um, okay. But part of the stipendium scholarship is for as long as they fund you, you need to come back and work like in your community service years back in South Africa. Okay. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Really cool. So I see quite a lot of comments as well there. Dream big. Um, yeah, learning, uh, learning Hungarian. Um, I think it's more just, as you said, you know, making uh, make, making the decision to, you know, what you want. It's as important to know what you want as what you don't want. Um, and, and being able to do that is wonderful. Yeah. Any questions for Nicole? Any, any uh, travel tips? It looks like uh, there's going to be a lot of people visiting Hungary after looking at those photos. Very, very cool. Thank you so much, Nicole. Really amazing. Thanks. So ladies, yeah, I think what an amazing way to kick off the year. Pop your cameras on if you can, please, so that I don't feel like I'm just talking to myself. Um, but yeah, thank you to the three speakers. I think those three different perspectives of change and um, just, I think, like stepping into your um, decision and knowing that this is the decision for you was just really inspirational. So thank you to the three of you, really. Um, I think it's kind of exciting. It kind of makes you realize that anything is possible if you are open to it. You know, if, you, if you're open to even stepping out just a little bit of your comfort zone, look what can happen. Um, any thoughts, guys? What do you think? What is kind of going through your mind now in terms of what you've heard and, and how it impacts you? Natasha, I'm going to call on you just because you're right in the middle of my screen. I just love it. I love the topic, Lauren. Um, the fact that, you know, COVID has brought so many changes and we're just embracing change. And I think for me, the biggest thing is you know, just embrace the changes and choose your challenges and don't see it as an obstacle in the way, but seeing it as a stepping stone to the future. Yes. So, yeah, so I've loved, I've loved the topic tonight. Thank you. Pleasure. Michelle? What I've taken out of it is just to be brave, you know, stop second guessing yourself if you want to do something um, as long as it's within the law then you know take the leap and go and do it absolutely and I love that like we often second guess ourselves out of change you know we 
we kind of doubt ourselves and if you have all the facts and you and you trust yourself then you go fantastic any other comments any other kind of thinking like how has this influenced your year like what you thought was going to happen this year versus what you think is now possible Uh, Lauren, I'll jump in again. I think the big thing that came up for me is I was looking at, okay, so what is my goal for the year? You know, how many people do I want to impact? And when Z Zandile said she's doing 10 million, I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> in 10 years. I was like, okay, I need to reevaluate and look at what my goals are because they obviously, um, they're not in that league, Zandile. So I admire you for your vision. So thank you for stretching mine. As you know, as um, there's that old quote, you know, um, aim for the moon and if you miss, you'll always fall amongst the stars. So it's aim as high as you can because you, you're still going to achieve more than you thought, which I think is amazing. Um, a couple of you on this call, we've had this conversation earlier this year about setting intentions for the year. So instead of having um, New Year's resolutions or goals that you want to achieve, which I'm absolutely not knocking, but those are very oriented on, on um, a specific achievement, whereas an intention becomes how you actually orient your life towards achieving your goals. So if you want to, for example, um, if you want to be um, fit um, and and um, so I turn 46 in August and I want to run a 10k when I around my birthday I can't wake up on the 1st of August and start training I'm not gonna you know so what am I doing today and how am I living and orienting my intentions to achieve the goals that I have in place so if I do want to run 10ks around my birthday I need to start putting that plan now and living that plan. So, you know, I need how am I getting fit? How am I getting strong? Um, how am I eating to give myself the nourishment I need, etc. So as opposed to the 10K race becoming my focus, the 10K race becomes an, a measurable outcome of the intentions that you've committed to. And I think when you look at that, change becomes um a part of that because you accept that to get where you want to go change is necessary it no longer becomes a scary thing it becomes a pathway or a tool and i just yeah listening to the three ladies today i just that really reinforced with me like you design your life with intention by making the decisions towards where you want to end up so very very cool any comments guys um, I see yeah, lots of nice things going on in the chat. Thank you. Very cool. Very nice. Really, really cool. So ladies, I hope that this has been a great start for the year um, for today um, and just listening to these ladies share. I hope that you kind of, if you've been sitting on the fence about something, this was the little nudge you needed to embrace your change and to and to and to give your life the intention that you want to achieve what you want. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and to our three speakers, thank you so much. Really, it's been wonderful. And I look forward to seeing you guys at the next event. Have a great evening. Thanks, Lauren and everyone. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks. Bye. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much, Bye. ladies. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.